If I could kindly ask you to yes. take your seats, we would begin in a minute. Okay, so if you would allow me to begin, uh, good afternoon uh, and welcome to a panel on disinformation online, reducing harm, protecting rights. Uh, I am very happy to see so many of you despite that uh, lunch break has just started. Uh, we have three brilliant speakers here, uh, and they are actually sitting in the alphabetical order. Uh, so, so we have Damien Tambini, uh, expert in media and communication regulations at the London School of Economics. We have Miranda Sissons uh, from Facebook, where she's the new director of human rights. And we have senior expert from NATO's uh, strategic communication center of excellence, uh, Sebastian Bay. And we have two main topics that we would like to address uh, during this panel. Oh, I should actually introduce myself as well. My name is Jakub Kalensky. I work in the Atlantic Council. Previously, I worked for the European Union, and I have been covering Russian disinformation campaigns in both of these capacities. Uh, we have two main topics uh, for this panel. Uh, the first one is, uh, what are the emerging challenges and approaches to tackling disinformation? And the second topic would be, what have we done so far and what else do we need to do? And the way we are going to do this, I will have two rounds of questions uh, uh, for the panelists. Uh, I will give them five minutes each uh, for their answers. And I hope we will have uh, 20, 15, 20 minutes for questions uh, from the audience. So please uh, prepare your questions uh, for this final part. And uh, since this panel is so short, just 60 minutes, uh, let us kick off. Damien, uh, please tell us, what do you see as the uh, emerging challenges in countering disinformation, the emerging threats, uh, uh, what keeps you awake at night, as they say? I, th I think one of the key challenges as we approach disinformation is to, is to be absolutely clear that it's a very different problem in democracies to non-democracies. So everything I have to say today will be about how democracies deal with this particularly difficult problem. And what I think my main message is, is that we need to get away from a whack-a-mole approach. So disinformation pops up here and there along with other problems of undesirable content. And the regulatory problem is to block it, stop it, filter it. Um, and uh, then potentially move on to the next problem. I would argue that the intellectual change we need to make is to think about this systematically, think about it systemically. And there the problem is rather how in democracies have we evolved media systems that were optimized for truth and trust over the past previous centuries. Um, and my argument is really that in democracies, we have a number of positive interventions. We have uh, institutions which have evolved, and we have a particular approach to freedom of expression in particular. Um, so this very interesting period that we're living, particularly in, in Europe, but also in other democracies, where we're trying to evolve new regulatory frameworks for tech platforms, for the various um, choke points and gatekeepers on the internet, this very interesting period is replaying a lot of things which have a, a, a deeper history. But some, some specific things uh, about what's, what's happening right now in terms of policy. Um, <clears throat> behind all this, I think philosophically, 
the reason we're having such a deep, profound, and prolonged debate about disinformation is because it's such a problem for democracies. Um, the three philosophical arguments for free speech uh, are uh, the argument from truth, from democracy, and from self-expression. And for various reasons we don't have time to go into, the problem of disinformation poses deep problems for all of them. As a result, legally and constitutionally, in the way that uh, laws on free expression are constructed, there are new justifiable restrictions for free speech on the basis of national security and other justifiable um, ways of restricting free speech, both in terms of the UN system under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but also under the European Convention on Human Rights. There are new, clearly, um, constitutionally and in human rights terms, uh, justifiable uh, restrictions. So what is happening to that, and what are the dangers for free speech? There are different approaches. Uh, in some countries, new uh, forms of offence are being evolved. So the, the law on elections in France introduces new things that are illegal, new categories of illegal content. And there are many other examples of attempts to bring in fake news. And the key problem there is, obviously, who decides? How can it be independent, who depend, independent from the state? How do we in, avoid a ministry of truth? The second uh, way of uh, dealing with this is to introduce new procedural um, uh, and liability rules about how illegal or also potentially harmful content is dealt with. So we can see in NetsDG in Germany, new systems of fines, time limits to tighten up the restrictions. And we can see a wider debate looming on uh, the uh, exemptions from liability under the e-commerce directive and the uh, uh, US de uh, legislation as well. So we have changes to uh, the uh, new forms of offense, new uh, procedures, and we also have uh, new, various forms of self-regulatory uh, approach, for example, the code of conduct uh, on so-called fake news uh, in, in, the, in the European Union. So Europe is, a, is, a, is emerging something of a laboratory of new policies, um, but these engage a lot of very familiar uh, and, and uh, deep constitutional problems. So, what I would, in my last minute, uh, call for is um, real action to actually uh, try to bring together democracies to bottom out some of the real philosophical differences. There are deep differences between European Union, um, uh, well, sorry, European Convention approaches to whether it is justified to positively intervene uh, to promote truth and trust in the way I would argue systematically uh, European media systems have done in the past. But it also requires a linking up with uh, competition policy in ways that we can potentially discuss. So I think there are a number of things that democracies in particular need to do to come together to deal with these. These are quite separate to how uh, non-democracies deal with it. And we should not overestimate the um, uh, the similarity between different democracies. So in that context, uh, the particular example, which I think is worthy of discussion if people are interested in, is the UK approach. The UK is currently discussing uh, legislation. Uh, we're in an election cycle, so uh, the, there's no government representative here. I'm speaking in a personal capacity, but I could speak about what's happening uh, in the UK. And there is a very radical approach to, uh, to the second problem I, I discussed, changing the approach to liability and introducing what is called a new duty of care for online platforms. This is not strict liability. This is not a shield from liability. But it is an attempt to change the systemic incentives so that platforms have a different set of incentives, all platforms. Uh, they are regulated. Um, to ensure that they reduce the incidence of harm on those platforms and there would be a succession of fines. So we're in the policy cycle where this is being discussed. The various parties in the election all have 
positions, more or less, and commitments to this, uh, and we will legislate in the next year for quite a different approach to online harms in the UK. Thank you very much. Uh, Miranda. Well, I wish I could echo that speech in its uh, specificity and its insight 100%. <laughs> um, I have recently arrived as the Director of Human Rights at Facebook and are grappling with different questions related to misinformation and disinformation. Um, from the perspective of someone who's been a long-term human rights activist, but in a company where we don't have the luxury of just confronting this in democracies, but we confront it wherever the platform is used around the world. And in the last two years, Facebook has, um, and needed to, upped its game considerably in the misinformation world. And I can, in the second question, address what we're doing along the remove, reduce, and inform framework. And what is very clear, I think, that is somewhat different from the generalized discussion of misinformation, is that we are hosting a number of different ecosystem, platform, internet, um, and incentive models under the rubric of misinformation, which many of us know well. And that Facebook has certainly been trying to take a number of different kinds of actions to combat all of those, which ultimately requires deep partnerships in a variety of different ecosystems um, and a look at incentives overall. So in the remove, reduce, inform approach, we seek to block and remove fake accounts, to remove the information that obviously violates our community standards or <coughs> contributes to offline violence and to, remove, to find and remove bad actors. And in that work, this is an extremely adversarial space. Um, some of this, some of the misinformation is contributed by extensive financial incentives um, and by contributing ecosystems um, that contribute significantly to um, disinformation as well as misinformation. Um, but where our systems are also being tested and the nature of security, misinformation and kind of technical challenges evolves on a monthly basis. And if you look, for example, at our most recent transparency report that was released two weeks ago, I think, you will see significant rise, for example, in the number of fake accounts we are removing through AI before they are detected by users that has steeply accelerated in the last <laughs> couple of months, which is, I think, a testament to how much people are trying to break our systems in this regard. We remove, uh, we reduce the virality and spread of false news and misinformation through a number of different uh, transparency and contextual treatments, and there's a lot more to do in that space. I think we as a company are learning a lot more about the cues that users need to make good decisions to understand the context of information and to reduce friction of sharing. You've seen some interventions in that space in WhatsApp, some interventions in terms of contextual and understand treatments, and there are many more to come. Um, and that we inform. And information, which is often the, pan is often the first resort of us highly intellectual, highly right-sensitive people where if we inform people, we will make better choices. That is a very important treatment. It is extremely important to the human rights space, but it is not effective, as effective at the user level as system-wide interventions. So I think if you ask me what's new in this space and what keeps me up at night, it is in fact that the that I hope that this conversation, uh, which is, I think, a very fruitful one, can be driven to the questions of prevalence and dynamics of incentives and ecosystems in a way that makes it actionable. That bad actors in adversary are evolving and have evolved much quicker than partnerships have, and we all need to do more to partner and effectively in this day, space, particularly the companies. And that there, is, that there is a race to the bottom at the moment for legislation that is nominally about fake news or nominally about hate speech, that 
may or may not be well-intentioned, but is being put out a number of governments that lacks the rigor and specificity that gives you any idea that it is genuinely going to be used to combat this problem. Uh, that instead of seeing perhaps thoughtful regulatory models or innovation that we might be saying at the EU, EU level, in other places we are seeing a lot of bad faith initiatives. And so from a human rights point of view, I would also be very interested in thinking about ways we can encourage that as a race to the top. And I don't know, but last night I was thinking, what about the right to truth? What about the Latin American example? What about the German examples? What about, is there a core there where we can use to bring this up to protect against misinformation, but also lift the boat for all rights? And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Uh, and I actually have to agree with you that, that uh, I do see that uh, the bad actors are evolving their tactics much more, in a much more quick way than, than actually we, we counter them, uh, especially the actor I have been focusing on in the past few years. <laughs> uh, Sebastian, uh, what would you see as the, as the main challenge in countering disinformation? Well, thank you very much. And I'm, thank you, Damien, for talking about you know, the need to get away from a whack-a-mole approach, and yes. also Miranda from uh, emphasizing and focusing on the strength of the entire antagonists and what they are doing. Uh, I will focus on two points now, briefly. Uh, globalization of disinformation and meta-manipulation, as I think are two of the main upcoming or actually already evolved problems that we're seeing. As we're studying the disinformation industry, and I work as a researcher for NATO's Strategic Communication Center of Excellence, where we study malicious use of social media, mostly through the harms perspective from an antagonist's view. And what we're seeing is how this industry is evolving, where we're getting certain countries that specialize in developing software for social media manipulation. We see other countries that are developing in content creation, third countries that are specializing in uh, crowdsourcing or sometimes even crowdfunding uh, social media manipulation. Um, and we see how these things come together. Um, just two days ago, I was experimenting with a Nigerian social media manipulation service provider, um, buying uh, social media manipulation from them, uh, seeing that they were using a set of Russian software to deliver this manipulation, and most probably using content creation from uh, Southeast Asia. So we're, we're seeing how this industry is coming together, it's becoming more effective, and we have every reason to believe that this, this information industry is growing. When we're looking at these actors in Europe, we see that because they're official companies, we see that their turnover increases from year to year, many of them doubling their profits and turnover. And it's available to anyone. It's not just available to state actors, it's available to you and me. And that is a problem. It is a problem also that it's so cheap and so readily available for everyone. I think we see some positive steps there. I really appreciate WhatsApp came out and said that they were going to sue any company that was uh, set on undermining their platform. I think that was an important step. We've seen Facebook take action against some companies that are manipulating their platform, but there is much more to be done. Many of these companies are acting in the open, and, and they're not really facing the consequences of this. I think the, the most interesting way to look at you know, how effective are these is just you become a customer, buy 10 likes on something, because then you start getting advertisement from these companies and they'll tell you whenever they are unable to deliver services. For an example, the Nigerian company told me that ah, we can't manipulate, we can't buy likes on, no, we can't buy followers on Instagram for this week, but we're working on a solution. Uh, but all other services are up and functioning, so no problem, just place your orders. And uh, if you go to these service providers, and this leads me to the second point, it's meta-manipulation. So what are they selling? What are they promoting, these uh, social media manipulation service providers? Well, they are uh, promoting meta-manipulation, and that is triggering algorithms to show content. And we've done experiments to see how this works. You buy views, this trigger algorithms, and this uh, makes the video trend, and it gets authentic views. <clears throat> now, this is good uh, from two perspectives, uh, from the antagonist side, 
A, it's extremely difficult for researchers to see. You cannot see who actually viewed a YouTube video, for an example. So it's very difficult to see that this is going on. And we've also seen through an experiment that we've done that this is where the largest weaknesses in the social media platforms are. In about a week and a half, I'll launch a report where we've done strategic, where we've done buys on all the four main platforms using 16 different uh, manipulation service providers. And if there's one field I'd highlight now, it is that all the platforms are consistently bad when it comes to blocking meta manipulation, that is views and so on. Uh, you get 100% of what you buy all the time. And this is of course a problem, and this is a field where uh, I think that antagonists are um, evolving and, and, and using because it's somewhere where you don't get caught very easily. So that's where I'm going to end. Uh, those are my two trends that I'd wish to highlight. The, glo the globalization of the disinformation industry and the problems that bring both for attribution but also for combating it and the problem of meta manipulation because we cannot properly assess with the data access we have today to what extent this is going on and which, what harm it is doing. Thank you very much, Sebastian, and thank you for keeping the time. Uh, uh, I, I would underline the globalization problem. Not only we see increasingly more actors uh, learning from each other and adopting each other's tactics, but we also see that domestic actors are actually learning from these bad actors. And uh, when, when you plant a disinformation as a foreign actor and you have a local actor repeating it after you, for his purely domestic, uh, political, cynical reasons, uh, it actually whitewashes the uh, information aggression of the, of the initial bad actors, which is, uh, which is a problem I increasingly see in Europe. Okay, so, 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 uh, so we have uh, the first challenge, how to actually counter disinformation and not violate uh, freedom of speech and, and similar, similar rules. Uh, how to evolve the partnerships uh, for countering disinformation. And, and the two problems that Sebastian just highlighted, the globalization of disinformation and uh, uh, the increasing threat of uh, meta manipulation. Um, now, it is, it, I would actually pick on this, this Miranda's uh, point on how, how do we evolve the partnerships uh, to, to counter disinformation. And this, this brings me to the uh, second question. What have we done so far and what more do we need uh, uh, to be done? And we have representatives of three different sectors. Uh, Sebastian, although uh, NATO Stratcom Center of Excellence is more a research center, you are probably the closest we have here uh, to, to a government, so, so you would give us the government perspective, we have here the platforms and the private business and we have the research community. So I would actually like to ask each of you, what would you need to see from the other two segments? Uh, what, what would the research community like to see from, from the private business, from the social media platforms and from the governments? Uh, Damien, if you would uh, give us your perspective. Uh, well, from the, from the platforms, it's data unconditionally on our terms. We don't need to go into that um, uh, in too much detail. It's an old debate. But can I just pick up, because we've been discussing this in terms of a security problem and speaking about adversaries, and there's a point which is very often missed, and it's a fundamental point about deliberate disinformation and so-called info war. This is a war on democracies by non-democracies. It is asymmetrical. If one of the participants in this conflict uh, has genuine popular sovereignty, then it matters if the opinions of its citizens can be manipulated. If the other participant does not have popular sovereignty, you can have exactly the same disinformation against that adversary with no impact at all on that uh, that nation state's ability to act and ability to respond. So it's a war by non-democracies, on all democracies, and on democracy itself. So when we consider how to respond to this and the role of platforms, the role of governments, it's absolutely fundamental that any solution builds but does not undermine trust. So just to pick up on... Um, you have, for example, just a, a, a dominant platform like Facebook. We need to understand that the, there are quite clear links between questions of competition policy, how big is 
a platform like Facebook per permitted to be, and all of the questions of censorship and free speech. Because if Facebook removes and reduces uh, content, filters, blocks, uh, downgrades, um, that may, particularly in a European approach, be considered to be a form of censorship because effectively this is a dominant platform controlling speech. It has more censorship-like uh, um, consequences. But also, it's entirely, um, uh, it's, it's really very important that the, um, the trust that the public and civil society has in any of those processes involves information and in, involves genuine ownership by civil society of those mechanisms for filtering and taking down, all of those mechanisms for res responding to what might be considered adversarial content by some, but potentially by not all of the citizens. So the issue of independence and ownership by civil society of those censorship-like um, processes is fundamental for the ability of democracies to deal with what is a really fundamental challenge without damaging trust in democracy further. We're in a very critical moment in democracies in terms of trust. So this is a key issue. Um, it, when we're developing uh, platform-based solutions, they really must do more to involve civil society and ensure that they're trusted. Otherwise, their filtering is just another conspiracy. Thank you. I, I guess you might want to react to this. No, I, I don't mind. I'm happy to. Um, no, that, that's a very, very, very good comment. Um, and I expect that people who have been at Facebook longer than I would say, yeah. And um, that is very important reason, one reason why we have put such effort into creating now the Facebook Oversight Board, partly uh, which has had a very robust consultation process in the last year. Um, to try and broaden the input in these issues um, across content that is related to community standards. And that obviously Facebook's development of the remove, reduce, inform framework is relying very heavily on reduce and inform in order to minimize those censorship concerns. It obviously doesn't sidestep them or make up for them but that, that it is not an approach where it is simply, it is, it is absolutely, it is seeking, deploying a number of tools to try and work on systemic issues such as coordinated inauthentic behavior, which is a pretty good policy that looks at behavior rather than content to allow us to remove a great deal of inauthentic behavior. Um, the takedowns of which are publicly announced and the data of which is shared with the Atlantic Council um, and where we're also seeking, I think, in an ideal world, to expand the number of partnerships with which we can lodge that data so that it is more uh, available to researchers. And I'm interested in, for example, in feedback on the Social Science One experiment that we're doing, which is an attempt, in fact, to bring a broad variety of data, um, including uh, under careful conditions and in a careful, uh, carefully structured manner available to the research community to study. I'm not sure, I mean, I think this question though is a fundamental one to do with trust, which is why uh, one has to also look at the frameworks that engender the most trust and that will work differently in different societies. But in the human rights framework, even within freedom of expression, because freedom, as the global director of human rights, of course, I don't just care about freedom of expression. And I'm quite a sophisticated user of the freedom of expression, including all of the permissible limits on freedom of expression, which include limits for the, to acknowledge the rights and responsibilities of others for public order. Um, but must meet certain tests. They must meet tests of lawfulness and legitimacy. Um, they must meet uh, to be necessary to protect rights and democracy and tests of proportionality. And it's a little bit to the detriment of the human rights framework that these very good tests are kind of technically locked away in lots of jurisprudential 
boxes and it makes it very hard for broader audiences to engage in them. But I think on my first day at Facebook in a policy on voter suppression and, and somebody said, oh, restriction of speech. And I said, you have to be joking. Look at the guidance of the Human Rights Committee. It is perfectly permitted under a human rights framework to reduce the manipulative misinformation directed at voters. Um, and that part of my job is, in fact, to bring some of the strength in the framework into the rather arid debates over freedom of speech that, that have existed to date and to bring the protective capacity to environments. And when, when I look at that, one of my greatest challenges is, is to some extent, the breadth of the gap between the disinformation, misinformation and cybersecurity world and, in fact, the digital rights world in general and the broader human rights community that has worked and suffered from and been involved with debates around this stuff for, for 60 years. Um, and for me, as the human rights director working with a cybersecurity team, passionately interested in disinformation, its impact, particularly in the most fragile environments where we see this Russian playbook having so much damage, that is one particular challenge that you know, we, for example, haven't surfaced here, but I think it's very important to surface in order to give, again, greater encouragement to that race to the top in all environments. Thank you very much. And I will actually have, have to have a question, but first I would like to ask uh, Sebastian. So, so uh, what has been done so far? What more do we actually need to be done? And what you, as a representative of the government slash research community, what would you like to see from the platforms, from, from other researchers? So, um, being a government think tank, we have the uh, opportunity to put pressure on government as well. Uh, I think a lot has been done, uh, not the least in the sense that we've shifted discussion from regulating content to regulating uh, everything that surrounds this information, focusing on coordinated, inauthentic behavior above all. Uh, of course, why we are interested in this is because antagonistic states are using these tools to undermine democracy. But when we study this problem, uh, we assess that as much as 90% of this manipulation is not aimed at states or democracy. It's aimed at commercial interests. It's ad industry fraud. It is commercial fraud. It's fraud directed at Hotels.com or TripAdvisor or any other of such things. So, yes, I'm a strong believer in that we need to regulate social media companies to force them to put more uh, resources into combating this problem, but also to make it more of a level playing field. And in the report we'll launch, one of the things that we'll show is that all social media companies are not equally bad at this or equally good at this. Rather, there is quite a big difference between different social media platforms, even plat with, within platforms or between platforms owned by the same company. So that we can see that there's a big difference here and we need to make sure that that there's a level playing field. It can't be a race to the bottom from the perspective of who spends less makes the le greatest profit. We need to make sure that there's a standard for how to combat these things online. Um, the other aspect of this, and I already mentioned it, is to regulate the market for social media manipulation. Just here in Berlin, there's a company, they have 11 full-time employees, they turn over, over a million euros a year, and their only job is to, um, to manipulate uh, social media platforms. Now, I have a difficult time seeing the legitimate reasons for allowing these services to exist, but I also think that social media companies could have done more in the past to, um, to fight back against these companies. Uh, nonetheless, at least because we see that many of these social media platforms, they, they use the, these, uh, the social media manipulation service providers, they use social media companies to market their services. You'll find YouTube channels where they have tutorials on how to buy fake YouTube likes. You'll have Instagram channels where they are marketing their services. You'll have uh, them buying Google and Bing ads to promote their services. And this is a little bit like the bank allowing the robbers to do recruitment on the bank notice boards. It's, it's, it's the immediate and simple step you can take to make it more difficult and more expensive to buy these manipulation services. And, and we need to, to take those steps. So I really appreciate what WhatsApp has done in saying that we're going to sue any company that offers these services. I think that's an important step. I also think that we need to standardize to a much larger extent when it comes to reporting and terminology. And I think uh, the government probably should have a lead in this 
uh, if the industry isn't able to do that. For an example, each social media company reports on the number of blocked accounts. Well, there is no standardization for what accounts, what is a blocked account. So it's very difficult to look at all the platforms and say who's better or worse at this. Also, I think how this reporting is done need to look at things that are you know, more meaningful. The number of blocked accounts is actually quite a useful, useless uh, thing. It's, it's useful in the sense that it shows the extent of antagonists trying to manipulate and undermine the platform. But of course, what we want to know is not how many times the bank robbers tried to rob the bank. We want to know whether or not they succeeded. Is the money still in the vault or not? So how many actually got past the gates and how many are on the platforms at this moment wrecking havoc? And we don't have that sort of reporting because we don't have a terminology and we don't have a standard set of uh, relating to this. And then I'll loop back to what I've already mentioned. We need to standardize uh, and incentivize the amount of resources that social media platforms put into this. We've seen when we've looked at this that technical know-how, strength of platforms, how they were built, resources put in by the different companies, it makes a big difference. It can make a difference, 50% difference between different platforms and their ability to combat this manipulation industry. I.e., we need to hold all these companies to the same standard, and that's probably a standard that needs to be set by government. Um, but I think it will actually help social media companies because it will level the playing field, it will make it fair, it will make it uh, in the sense that uh, if every company have to put in the same amount of resources, uh, it will make it easier to compete in this field. So I think that will, it's a thing that will be mutually beneficial. Thank you very much. I'm always grateful for very specific recommendations. Uh, it's, uh, happy to hear that. Before I open the floor uh, for the questions for the audience, uh, I, I will abuse my authority as the moderator and let me pose a question to the panelists. Uh, I, while I do understand uh, the concerns whether we do not violate the freedom of speech um, by certain measures on social media, I, I think it's always useful to emphasize that we already do have limitations to freedom of speech. In, in most of the countries, it's illegal to deny Holocaust. <laughs> in my country, it's illegal to spread false alarm stories. I couldn't call to this building and say, there is a bomb, you should evacuate everyone and cause panic and, and chaos. Uh, and if you have a look at what those disinformation-oriented outlets uh, present, they are trying to pursue you that uh, the EU or your own government is committing terrorist attacks against its own nation, uh, that they are trying to substitute the white population with Muslim migration and they are organizing the migration because of that. In my opinion, we should be thinking whether the laws can't be adopted also, also in this case. What do you think about labeling the notorious disinformation-oriented outlets, uh, similarly to the tobacco approach? We do not ban tobacco, we just say it will harm your health. Uh, and frankly, I, I see no reason why YouTube should be recommending Russia Today videos about Robert Mueller's investigation saying that um, Robert Mueller hasn't proven any Russian meddling into the US election. It's a lie. We know that Russia Today lies. Why should be YouTube recommending a notorious lying outlet? Shouldn't they label it as a toxic source of information, similarly to a tobacco product? Well, just briefly, uh, I mean, th there is... There are a couple of problems with labelling. I mean, I, in general, I think it's a, it's a reasonable thing to do. If we assume, though, that it's going to be a solution, we might be making the wrong assumptions on the extent to which humans seek truth. Uh, the, the research tends to suggest that when deciding whether to uh, be uh, affected by something, whether to share something, whether to like something, uh, whether to read something, whether it's true, true or not, um, or labelled as such, isn't a great um, incentive, or it's not a great, it doesn't make a huge amount of difference. And in fact, it can have perverse consequences. So it might feed the conspiracy theories, it might uh, make something, you know, something they're trying to hide from us again um, uh, for, for a significant amount of the market, and that may in turn um, contribute to virality of, of, of content. So, in general, labelling is a good thing. I think there's another set of questions around um, uh, machine-readable labels and whether labelling is something which is done by AI um, and read by AI. Um, and I think that there are a number of cross-cutting issues which apply to, to everything in this in terms of who is setting the standard which uh, would trigger the label, who is making the labelling decision, 
all of which have implications for censorship and trust and all of the, the things that we're wrestling with, and we need to be very careful. It's not impossible, and it's not that I say don't do it, but I say beware of the challenges. Uh, just a very short reaction. Actually, in Slovakia, they have this initiative called Konspiratorieska, and uh, there you have a board of uh, media professionals like journalists, academics, etc., uh, etc. Et and, and this is actually so, so a group of like 40 people decides yes, this outlet belongs to the list of disinformation spreading outlets, and then they are pressing the companies not to advertise on, on, on these outlets. Uh, so, so there is already a precedent for this. <laughs> I was just going to say, I guess we'll find out a lot about labelling because Facebook is now labelling state media or intending to from this mm -hmm. month or has just launched it um, using criteria of the, of the editorial independence criteria in the Facebook news tab. So, I mean, let's see. I think, I think we're in the position of, of knowing that there are many challenges and hoping it will be effective and that there is, as I mentioned, with our contextual treatments. Um, we'd always like them to be more effective than they are because that's the first and easiest way to try and inform people that what they're seeing and wanting to share may not be worth sharing. Mm -hmm. um, but um, let's see how that evolves. One of the fields in which uh, labeling has been discussed for quite some time is in the bot issue or automated account issue that we've said that it would be great if we could label automatic accounts. Uh, the problem is that we are unable to even identify what an automated account is now. And even when we do identify them and take them down, um, we have figures that show that on Twitter, for an example, account may stay up for five or 6,000 tweets before it gets removed. So um, yes, I think labeling would be good. It wouldn't have to necessarily need to be this tobacco package labeling of saying harmful. It could be a uh, this media outlet is owned by this state or controlled by this uh, group of interests. When it comes to technical labeling, labeling bots, uh, that, is a, that is an industry challenge because we are unable to differentiate between real and genuine accounts, I would say. So thinking that we then can label all the bots, is, uh, it's not technically feasible today. And that comes back to the fact that it's too easy to create fake accounts and that comes back to credentials and authentication online and the need to rethink that for the future. Thank you very much. So we still have 17 minutes left. Uh, I believe it was Stephanie who agreed to walk here with the mic. So do we have any questions from the audience? I see one here. Um, yeah, a couple of things. So on labeling, I've just shared on Twitter uh, an article that could you kindly introduce yourself? Sure, please? my name is Courtney Raj. I'm with the Committee to Protect Journalists. And I did an analysis when YouTube first launched a test pilot with um, labeling media outlets, and it's inconsistent. It would be great if we knew media ownership, but as having worked in the field of media development with colleagues here, oftentimes you don't know who owns the media. So labeling has all sorts of problems. I would encourage us to have a conversation and invite civil society who works in media to be part of these discussions because there is no one up there. And one of the concerning things I think about this conversation is that one of the most important antidotes in democracy specifically, which seems to be the context of this discussion, is quality journalism. And we haven't talked about how you can encourage and support journalism given the d dominance of the platforms and incumbency there. And second of all, when we talk about um, looking at behavior and un inauthentic behavior, we see all sorts of negative repercussions in non-democracies such as Kashmir, such as Egypt, um, where, con where accounts and content is being taken down that is not along the government or political party um, in power's point of view. So, um, you know, I think this is an important discussion, but I think when we talk too much about technical solutions, it's good to hear that we are seeing um, the discussion around competition and antitrust and these sort of um, things being talked about, but you, none of you mentioned, for example, the ability to target or micro-target audiences. Um, that obviously has a role to play in the manipulation of people's point of view. So I think there are a lot more topics to discuss in here, and I would definitely encourage you to think about in including maybe more fully full members of civil society, and especially of the journalism community, which is an important, has an important contribution to discussions around disinformation. Thank you. Thank you. If we could take uh, two more questions. 
So we have one there. Hello. Uh, my name is Michał Woźniak. I work for the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project in technical capacity. Um, I would just like to say that whenever Facebook is criticized for anything um, or, or faces a, a, a problem like, like this one, like disinformation, uh, we hear a lot about how the world is a big place. There's a lot of different uh, you know, regulatory environments and, and in all of those places Facebook has to work and it's very difficult. And that's a fair statement. However, I would just like to point out that this is Facebook's decision to have become a monopolist and be this one company for everything. So I don't think it's fair to keep using this um, this trump card. Um, and so my question would be, would Facebook consider not using this argument um, in, in such the discussions? Thank you. Thank you, and uh, we have one more question here. Hey, hey. I'm I'm Juan Pablo Madrid Malo, I come from Colombia. Uh, so I have to give a little background of what's happening right now. As you may or may not know, Colombia is right now in some sort of turmoil, uh, ongoing protests. And just on Saturday, uh, a curfew was announced in the capital city, Bogota. Uh, and this was around 8 p.m. At 8 p.m., suddenly, WhatsApp chains were being uh, sent massively all around the city, saying there were going to happen massive robberies in residential complexes. And all over the city, this was happening uh, real-time misinformation. So people, a city of about 8 million people in a matter of two hours was in total chaos and fear because they thought they were being robbed, so people were getting out of their houses armed with stones and sticks when nothing was going to happen, in fact. So how do we tackle real-time misinformation, especially when it can put in danger a lot of people? Thank you. Thanks a lot for your questions. Uh, so, so we have a question on how, how, how do we support uh, quality journalism because it, it is an essential element in, in countering disinformation. Uh, we have a question on how non-democratic societies abuse the, the rules for taking down content for their non-democratic purposes. Uh, we have a question directed at you, Miranda, if you would consider stopping using one of your arguments. And uh, how do we stop the uh, real-time disinformation campaigns? It actually reminds me of something that uh, happened uh, earlier in India, where also mass spreading of, of WhatsApp messages led to mob violence and, and even to death. So, who would like to start? Sebastian. Um, I really appreciate the challenge of uh, regulating in democratic states versus non-democratic states. And I thought the opening statement by Damien was very useful there. I, was in, I held a workshop in Nigeria two weeks ago and we discussed this issue. And civil society there is legitimately scared of any type of regulation because it might strike back from a state that is not democratic. Now. Does that mean also in democratic states we cannot regulate? Well, I'm a Swedish citizen and we like regulating, uh, i.e. I would argue, of course, that no, uh, there has to be a difference still. We have to recognize the challenges of regulation in non-democratic states, none the least because they often lack the technical capacity needed to do this regulation and oversight. I would say we lack that capacity in Sweden or in Latvia or even in Europe to a large extent, which makes it very difficult to regulate because it's a highly complex and highly knowledge intensive industry. Um, and that is needed for good regulation, of course, to be effective and useful. Uh, one of the other arguments that, or one of the other questions that came up is re how to combat real-time disinformation. I think this is probably the largest challenge and when the, sitting here at IGF and thinking of from a global perspective and responsibility protect, to protect, it's very easy to come back and see these situations where it goes out of control, where social media platforms are no longer platforms for sharing information, they become command and control centrals for antagonists wishing to commit genocide and so on. This is a huge challenge and one of the things we've been discussing within 
the framework of the uh, Christchurch call, for an example. And I, we've come further. We've, you know, we've reached a consensus when it comes to defining the problem, but when it comes to solution, there's still a lot to go. So it's very good, I think, that we lift this problem because we'll need a different set of solutions for real-time emergencies and for spreading information that might or might not be true. Um, I'm going to leave it at that and maybe come back later. Um, so in essence, one of the interventions that I think needs to be strengthened much more, but is a beginning intervention in this environment, and also to support quality journalism, would be that one of the reduce and inform treatments we're using is um, to support and hopefully expand um, quality fact-checking um, throughout um, many different parts of the world, so using the, the um, the quality standards of the International Fact Checking Network. And that's really in its infancy because it's only 55 partners. And so one of the things that's going to have to be involved there is also seeing how what we can do can assist partner development and impart, uh, and again, strengthen rather than weaken an ecosystem, which people are, are obviously that the, the platform advertising business has has significantly weakened. And that is when I talk about ecosystem, that's, you know, certainly at least some of us are looking, trying to look hard at that and say, okay, these are ecosystem issues but that we have contributed to, but that we need to solve. So that it isn't just a panacea to say that they are big and complicated. Um, and it's not an excuse I mean to invoke to justify any inaction, but rather that, in fact, in, instead of waiting for great European regulation, the reality is I'm de dealing with Singaporean and Vietnamese and Nigerian regulation, and that's just three of them, right? And that's my reality every day. So I don't have the luxury of waiting. I have to, in the regulatory sense, it, it's something, you know, to, to thoughtful work in this sphere is greatly to be encouraged, I think. And at the more universal standard, the better. So when I say race to the top, I think that's one of the things um, I'm very interested, because it's already happening, and it's already happening in environments that are non-democratic, and that really does impact journalists and, and ecosystems in those environments. Some other things we are doing to limit spreading in real time are things like the Trusted Partner Project, are things like building up the, the on-the-ground networks where people can inform us of specific pieces of misinformation that can lead to real world harm. They are very active in a number of different environments right now. They don't substitute, for example, for the very key problems with Facebook Live in the Christchurch call. But for example, we use those every day in Myanmar, in places like Ethiopia, and many in, in Turkey, in Iraq, to take stuff down all over the world. So though, those are, in some ways, the, the first step examples. Um, we've put out new policies on misinformation on harm. We will be put, putting out a policy on unverifiable rumors. Because of course, a great deal of the misinformation we see actually exists, and I'm not speaking about disinformation, but exists on a spectrum of people may or be, may not spreading information that cannot be verified by its very nature, but causes great fear or causes harm. Um, that people will share for a variety of, motion, of, of motives, and we're beginning, I think, our first attempts uh, to look at that from a policy level as well as from a design level, which is really about introducing friction, such as in the WhatsApp sharing that you referred to, but in a variety of other sharing uh, settings inside a variety, you know, several of the apps. So there's, there's more to come in this space, I think. Thank you very much. Um, I think we've heard a lot which underlines the importance of having different standards, different policy recommendations um, for democracies and non-democracies. Uh, and I think if there is a, a takeaway from this session or a potential recommendation, it may be that we need new uh, spaces and forums to have a deeper debate about freedom of expression uh, among democracies uh, and one which accepts that uh, regulation and freedom of expression are not inherently opposed. That is, all mature approaches to freedom of expression require uh, justified regulation. On journalism, I absolutely agree that journalists need to be involved and that journalism as uh, something, a, a, an ethic and a practice for truth-seeking and serving democracy is something that absolutely needs to be at the table, but we do need to consider it as a set of functions 
and not as a lobby, as a lobby for an industry that simply assumes that more journalism is better. Journalism is changing and we need to see it as a set of functions. Real-time misinformation absolutely requires responses, but in order to be effective and trusted, they need to be considered responses. In relation to the press, any form of uh, closure of speech or stopping of speech would require an independent involvement of a judge, an injunction, uh, and I would argue that uh, Facebook and other social media platforms need to evolve uh, fora and procedures that would enable any uh, emergency shutdowns or any emergency restrictions to involve an independent judge and to be subject to very high levels of, trans, uh, of transparency and also uh, uh, post hoc oversight so that these can be reviewed. Because uh, one person's misinformation is another person's uh, legitimate protest. Um, so uh, the attempt to uh, shut down uh, 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 a, a WhatsApp group, a particular WhatsApp message, or all of WhatsApp at a time of protest should be considered uh, with a great deal of seriousness uh, in any democracy. Final point, and I think to underline that, um, obviously this is not just about one company. It also needs to involve uh, not just a dominant uh, or several dominant face, uh, whoops, um, social media platforms. It needs to involve uh, all potential stakeholders and it needs to be trusted uh, by uh, all of those uh, in, uh, involved in that industry in any given democracy. So Facebook, I'm sorry, you can't do it alone. We have three last minutes, so maybe there's time for two more questions, one from each side. Uh, <coughs> gentleman here. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm Rasmus Nielsen from the Reuters Institute at the University of Oxford. My question is from Miranda. Uh, Miranda, first of all, thanks for being here. I think it's important that you're here and that you sort of step up in this way, so thanks for, for doing that. You said in your opening remarks that Facebook is reducing the virality and spread of disinformation and false news. Um, I guess my question is, and I'm not questioning your good faith or indeed the fact that the company from the very top wants to address these issues, um, but given the fact that you initially in 2016 went out saying this was a minimal problem, uh, if at all, and also that you have a record, um, uh, I think we can say an imperfect record of your metrics and your sharing of data, uh, I suppose fundamentally why should people trust you to mark your own homework? I mean, isn't this a little bit like BP saying we're re reducing carbon emissions or McDonald's saying we're improving public health with no independent oversight? Thank you very much. Uh, Mira Milosevic, uh, Executive Director of the Global Forum for Media Development, thank you very much for interesting contributions. Uh, we are just uh, um, uh, responding to some of the comments uh, of uh, lack of journalism and uh, media community in these debates by launching a new dynamic coalition on the sustainability of uh, journalism and news media uh, tomorrow here at the IGF within the IGF system, and we hope to contribute to these conversations much more in the future. Uh, I um, unfortunately have three questions, one for um, uh, Sebastian. Uh, in relation to what you mentioned that 90% of manipulation comes from mad fraud uh, and not malicious actors in, in the space of um, in intentional disinformation. Um, uh, there is a, an estimate that around 10 billion uh, US dollars annually um, goes to um, manipulation in the programmatic ad space. And you said that uh, there is little done to combat manipulation and to identify bots uh, and all those mechanisms that lead to this. Do you think that we could really address the problem of misinformation in the, in the digital space without properly ad addressing this and without properly addressing incentives in the advertising space that actually make money for malicious actors. So if you are a small um, uh, person who starts up a business in Macedonia, uh, you would rather uh, go into the uh, producing um, uh, content factories that make you money on certain platforms than going into journalism that doesn't make you any money. So my question is how do you address that? And if, uh, I'll, I'll skip then uh, a question for Miranda, but to Damien, what are the policy initiatives that you, uh, you see in terms of affirmative action 
uh, for supporting uh, not just journalism and news media, but uh, positive information spaces, um, maybe in Europe, uh, and what can be done in this regard? What are the best practices that, uh, that you've seen so far? I have a couple of questions for Miranda, but maybe we can do that later or in the session tomorrow. Thank you. Okay. Um, I don't know that I have an answer, an easy answer, a pat answer for whether people should trust Facebook. Of course, you know, people shouldn't necessarily trust any particular company. I think the question, we are reporting, for example, the misinformation edits under the European Code. We are reporting um, quite a lot, and I totally take the point that we can standardise measures and look at what's meaningful, but in the last 18 months, uh, Facebook has begun to... Um, report quite a lot of different and continually improved data on takedowns under community standards, and then a different set of data for Facebook and now for Instagram, and now um, takedowns to pursuant to government request. And they, they, the methodology for those has been independently taken out to and um, scrutinized by uh, a particular Yale multi-stakeholder academic group that probably has an impressive name that I can't remember, but the, to look that the data and the verifications were okay. So I can't convince you that you should. I'd, probably nobody should trust any particular company, but that we will need to be judged on what we've done and what impact it has. Um, given, I think, I think rightfully, um, I think all the public relations stuff for Facebook now says we were too slow to act and we didn't, and now we need to act. And that people should scrutinize that and test everyone they meet and test the data. But in this, we need to frame what does an adequate response look like? What is an effective response? What are the deepest ecosystem interventions we can make? A very short reply is no. <laughs> of, uh, definitely 100%. We need to combat uh, the ad industry fraud um, mechanism that make this a profitable industry. But we also need to work with the digital sweatshop shops in the global south that have no other opportunities for a livelihood than to contribute to this disinformation or ad industry fraud industry. So definitely we need to create better working conditions. Uh, in the global south, in the digital industries, so that people aren't drawn into this field. But we also need to go after it much harder um, where people make money off this, uh, so that this isn't happening. The reason why I'm interested in this, because I saw that one notorious Russian uh, disinformation outfit in St. Petersburg had also used commercial services, i.e. these commercial services, they strengthen their tools, they employ more developers because they make money from the ad industry fraud. And that is then used by state actors to leverage their tyranny on democracies. So if we can't get rid of the financial incentives, we're not going to get rid of the other part either. That's great. I started by asking for a systemic perspective, and I think we certainly had one on the panel, uh, because we do need to think about really the business model and the entire political economy behind it um, in order to deal with that if we think about this systemically. Um, I was asked about policy initiatives. Um, in that systemic sense, we have somehow evolved a business model which has for social media in particular, which has not been optimized for democracy. Um, it's been optimized for various forms of noise and vir virality and reinforcing of behavioral biases and things that maybe are not so good uh, for democracy. And any policy solutions need to address that at a systemic level. Um, I think we need to optimize in a sense for, for truth. Um, whilst accepting that there are always going to be contestations about that, about how truth has arrived at, and questions about who is deciding standards, etc. But some of the things uh, I think are, uh, uh, are now beginning to be spoken about. There are some interesting uh, policy proposals out there. I've mentioned in the UK an online harms white paper, which may lead to legislation 
uh, next year. Uh, many freedom of expression organisations have come out against that because it's seen as a centralised um, approach to deciding on uh, what constitutes truth and information. Um, but I think it's possible to evolve structures and processes that are independent of government and can achieve through transparency and civil society involvement sufficient trust with the overall framework. Um, I think we're at a stage now in the UK where it could go either way. Um, I think it's important to think about funding, funding the good stuff, and that includes public service, media, and labelling and literacy that we haven't spoken about a great deal. Um, there is a, um, an approach to literacy which is more radical and which um, involves speaking more specifically um, uh, about linking up uh, filters uh, with literacy education that we could go into. Uh, but all of this needs to be linked to other issues such as tax incentives, um, uh, following the money, the ad exchanges, etc., in order to change the incentives and the business models and the overall competition and antitrust framework. If we look historically, particularly at the post-war period in the wake of um, uh, authoritarian failure of democracy, we understand that there are periods when, for newspapers and for broadcasting, there were deep societal debates on how to evolve these institutions. I think we're entering one of those processes. Um, it's going to take longer than a lot of people think about, um, but it is going to need to address the entire business model, and it's going to need to use all of these different, co different uh, policy levers. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Damien. Uh, unfortunately, we are a few minutes uh, over time, so I will have to uh, close the panel here. Thank you very much for your questions. Thank you very much for your replies, and please uh, join me in, in a round of applause for the panelists. Yeah. I think hopefully I'll be great. Thank you.